What's up, Strong Girls Nation? Lonnie Silversides here. I have two special guests for you all today for our Chalk Talk. We have Morgan Jones, a former professional basketball player, and Hannah Mower, a former professional hockey player. This conversation is largely geared toward our high school and college student-athlete population. Whether you are finishing your athletic career and not sure how to move forward, or if your season finished unexpectedly due to COVID-19, there are some great tips in here for you as you think about your identity and purpose beyond the game. And the reality is all athletes at some point face this moment where they need to turn the page and head into their next chapter of life. And so our message to you is largely that you don't have to wait until then to prepare. Since their playing days, Hannah and Morgan have both turned their attention to helping other athletes lean into what comes next. Morgan founded Athletes to Visionaries, and Hannah founded Post Game Professions. You will hear a little bit about both of those in our talk. I will have an ebook that you'll be able to download with some of the prompts and reflections based on this conversation as well. So stay tuned for that, and we hope you enjoy. <laughs> Morgan and Hannah, thank you so much for joining us. I'd love to start off by you all just, I'd like to hear about your story. So um, Morgan, do you want to just share your story through sport, but outside of sport as well? We'll talk a little bit about both. Yeah, absolutely. So I started playing when I was young, seven years old, playing in the YMCA. We played co-ed, co-ed basketball. Um, and I had an older sister who was two and a half years older than me. I had two parents that coached me all the way through um, high school. Um, and AUs and leagues and things like that. And so I, I come from a basketball family. I came from and was surrounded by sports. Um, I had the luxury of being able to choose what sports. My parents didn't force me into one or the other. They allowed that space to choose. And so um, I got to high school and I had to choose either basketball or volleyball. Um, I loved volleyball. I liked basketball. Um, but I ultimately chose to kind of pursue basketball because of the opportunity that it provides. There was just a lot of scholarships and things. Um, and I knew the professional level was, was an opportunity. And so um, just kind of going in on basketball, I was um, the top 20 player in the country by the time I was a sophomore in high school um, by ESPN Hoop Girls. And then I made a goal for myself to say, I want to be a top 10 player in the country by the time I graduate high school. And so at that time, um, I worked really hard on my game, kept playing, kept sticking to the process, if you will. And by the time I was a junior, I was the number ninth player in the country. So with that comes um, a lot of attention from college coaches, right? So going from going to these tournaments and just watching the older kids play to going to these tournaments, playing these games that every college coach in the country is there. Um, and so I ultimately ended up choosing Northwestern University initially. Um, they were the underdog. They are in the Big Ten. And I really wanted to go to a program that I could help grow um, and take them from where they're at and where they're really trying to be. I want to be a big part of that. And so I chose Northwestern. But ultimately, getting there, um, it wasn't exactly what they had promised. Um, and so I kind of re-looked at a different opportunity of where I could go um, and transfer. So at that time, I transferred to Florida State University. Um, and loved it. I loved being a student there. I'm a very proud Seminole. I think I made a great decision for me at the end of the day and um, super proud of that. And so there we went on to the Elite Eight. So we were one game away from the Final Four. We lost to South Carolina. So kind of, I understand the, the, everything that goes into that, right? And um, just being under the lights and taking the last minute shots and all that. And so when I was done at Florida State in 2015, I then went on and, and decided to play professionally. Um, so I played professionally in Puerto Rico for one season and that was a little bit difficult because you go from college where everything is structured, your day, every step is like you go to practice, you go to team meal, you do this, you do that, to when you become a pro, you have to treat yourself like a pro. I mean, it's, it's like a job. They're paying you to produce. So I had the whole entire day to do whatever and I had practice at seven o'clock and then we would play three times a week. Otherwise, everything was up to me. Um, so I loved that freedom, but I'm not sure I really knew what to do with that freedom. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, but overall, I had, a, I had a great time. I played one season. I ended up coming back um, just due to the fact that 
had some um, deaths in the family and things like that. And, and also knew I was, I was feeling a, a, a pull because sport for me started to not be fun anymore. Um, I didn't value it the same. I started to really dislike the, I love you when you're doing great. I hate you when you're not. I got really old. And so um, I made the decision, like, I'm, I'm just going to be done with sport and I'm just going to trust whatever's next is going to present itself. And at that time, I'll deal with it. Um, sounds easy, right? Oh, we'll just go to what's next. <laughs> not at all. Um, I got no big that, deal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? Like, so transitioned out, really had no plan. I went home back on my parents' couch um, and had to, had to figure out life. And so I started my first job in sales, um, really liked it, but obviously really not too much purpose there in terms of like everything I feel like I can give the world. And so, you know, while I was in sales, I really started to use like that extra time in the office and that money that I was giving to start to like really kind of create a brand and look at this process of being an athlete from the lens of person first, athlete second, and then how they coincide. And that's where Athletes to Visionary started. That's where it created. And um, it's just been, it's been going great ever since. That's so awesome. I, there's so much that I want to make sure that we get to. We'll come back to you. One of the okay. things that um, popped into my mind that I wrote down right away is the structure piece of it. I think that's something I'd love to talk about in terms of helping some of our athletes right now whose seasons have gotten cut short mm -hmm. and they're home and for you know as a college athlete or even high school athlete your whole day has been structured everyone's telling you what when are you going to work out when are you doing this so um i definitely want to come back to come back to that of what you learned um as a pro with a little bit more freedom like that i think that can help some people today um hannah will you share your story with us yes for sure morgan amazing story i uh I didn't dig into your background either. So that's awesome to hear. Um, similar to everyone else, like I started, you know, playing all the sports growing up, always going for like the athlete of the year in high school or grade school. And um, I was playing competitive soccer and hockey growing up. Finally, later in, in the high school years, I had to make a choice which one I'd get serious with. I, I actually, thought I was a little bit better at soccer but I uh I I really loved hockey so I went for it I grew up playing with my brother in the in the garage on the um on the driveway just being kids but turned into a real love and growing up in Canada I was going after that scholarship in the states um and I managed to get a division one scholarship in northern Minnesota at Bemidji State and I did my four years there um, studied business administration and I really took the opportunity to do everything I could volunteer um, you know how those things go it's like it's optional but it's not optional I was made sure I signed up for those things. I was able to lead as a captain my senior year. And in 2016, when I graduated, um, I was lucky enough to go play professional in Sweden. I have my Canadian passport and my Swedish passport. Uh, so I did my MBA there while playing professional. So it was a little bit different of a time where I had to have structure because it was pretty much like, another year of division one sport, but, you know, in the professional setting, um, which was a little bit tough because everyone, instead of everyone being on the same schedule at school, I was the only, you know, student in my program on my professional team. There was a lot of girls, you know, like either watching Netflix or um, in women's hockey, a lot of them had to work still, uh, which is the reality of, a lot of women's professional sports. So I kind of found my routine. I, I got to know the bus system. I didn't have a car. Uh, and I got to also like bond with my Swedish family while I was over there. Um, and since I had my passport, it was perfect timing. The year before the Olympics, I got to go to the Swedish Olympic training camp, pre-Olympic tryout camp or whatever you want to call it um took my shot there and when I was 
faced with the decision to, you know, like you either didn't make it yet and you got to put your time in and we'll see. I took the decision to, you know, start my next chapter, take my, my education and find a real job or whatever they say. So I thought it would be easy. Um, And I soon found out that it's really not that easy to get a job, even if you're an athlete and you think you have the best qualities ever. And we know we're a good hire. We're driven and passionate and competitive for that matter. Um, But I was getting lost in, in the pile and the lack of experience because as we all know, we spend every summer training trying to get the starting lineup instead of, I say like the Google internship or something um, that was really to my disadvantage. So it was hard for me to even get the first interview I found. Um, But eventually after many no's, I landed a fully remote job um, with a company that I'm still at two years later. And we do business development for tech startups around the U S and yeah, it's great. My my fiance, he plays professional hockey over in Europe. So we're in different countries or different cities every year. And I get to grow professionally while, um, you know, being with my person and supporting him. But I was also lacking that, you know, like it's the sales thing, just like Morgan was talking about. Even if you're doing great, you're missing that, like the team, the, the athlete um, community and everything that goes along with who you were as an athlete when, when we were, you know, little kids up until you're just dropped off and you become a real person or, you know, a non-athlete or whatever people call us. And (laughs) I just, I, I realized that there had to be a way to kind of connect again. And that's where post game professions came in. And I launched that in January um, where we basically help connect female athletes, um, college level athletes or pro athletes to careers, whether they're still playing and they have that extra time like Morgan, you know, or they are done their sport and they're ready to make the transition into the, the professional scene. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm, I'm doing both right now and post game professions is, is my dream. So awesome. Well, I yeah. would have to say, Hannah, I love your feed. Like, your, uh-huh, thank like you. your Instagram is awesome. I'm like, oh my God, how did she do this? <laughs> yeah. Lonnie will know. Like, like, how do you do this? Let me help you. Canva, me. Canva, <laughs> Canva. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Know, it's so good. I love it. Thank well, I you. love that both of you also are still continuing, um, you know, taking your experiences and continuing to work. So my, I played all many sports and again, uh, like you both kind of, did as many as I could until I was forced to decide. I think kids are younger, younger and younger, sort of being told they need to choose one sport Mm -hmm. Um, earlier. It sounds like we all made it at least through high school or to high school before needing to kind of zoom in on on one thing. So I also played college basketball um, and then entered the field of teaching and coaching, which means I've been in the game really since, right? Um, So there wasn't really an abrupt, there was an abrupt, ish ending to my playing but I still was it didn't feel I think the same as what it feels like for some people that are that are ending their um you know playing days um and transitioning into something really different um so one of the things that that I love that you mentioned was chapter you know like you know, like thinking of our, if we think of our sort of phases of life in chapters, as opposed to ending, right? We're not closing the book. It's just like turning the page. Um, So what are some things that helped you all in, what are some things maybe, maybe even sport related, like skills that you learned as an athlete that helped you with that transition, but also just maybe other things, like maybe it's just support or community or you know, it was, it sounded like you learned how to get through Hannah multiple no's before getting yeses. So like, you know, was that sort of, um, that resilience and persistence something that was, was still really hard for you or, or did you rely on your hockey background to kind of get through that time? Like, what are some tips that you maybe have for some of these student athletes that are approaching or, or near the end 
of their what their career is, whether it's high school, college, or professional, and they're needing to think about what's next for me. Yeah, I mean, just to start in general, like the power of connection is so big and kind of what Morgan was saying about how we're a person first and an athlete second. I mean, we have to remember that even when, you know, if you're listening to this and you're still in college, you've got another year or you're just a freshman or you're going on and playing pro and, you know, it's easy to just be an athlete and kind of choose it as a privilege and kind of take the, the good hand that's dealt with with what comes with, you know, playing a sport. But I think the people who persevere is kind of when you realize that you're also a person and you kind of have that social responsibility to engage with your community and do the volunteering stuff and, um, you know, talk to fans or whatever it is and listening to people and kind of not expecting anything in return when you're connecting with people, but just connecting to, to listen and be engaged. And those relationships that you build are going to pay off somewhere down the road, whether it's your next job or it's your fifth job from now in like 10 years, that person that you, you know, complimented or helped them out, whatever it is, um, it, it comes back and you think it's kind of like an extra thing that you don't have to do at the time, but it's, it's so huge. And it also allows you to remind yourself and be humbled that that af- athlete privilege isn't forever. And we're going to have to work with regular people one day. And how do we, how do we communicate with them? How do we react? How do we lead Um, because we have something from sports that many people don't have. They don't know how to maybe hear no or criticism the way that we do. And that's something I've learned big time is the fact that somebody is criticizing your work means that they believe in you and that you can be so much better, which is you always want to be in a position where you can get better, right? like what you hear from coaches all your coaches yelling at you because they care right yeah exactly and it's something that maybe we forget when we first get our first you know job in the real world it's like so terrifying when you get kind of scolded or you did something wrong and and then you realize oh wow I've been doing this my whole life like I know exactly how to take this as a positive and really push me forward or top of my you know, class in, in work and in our work environment. So, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. I love that too. And, and the, um, that connection part is exactly what I would say. Like relationships have been everything um, in college and still really good friends um, with some of the other athletes and students that were at Florida State when I was there. And just now what they're doing, <laughs> I mean, I have friends mm-hmm. that are working at ESPN and they're just, everyone's just doing their thing. And, and, and to your point, you made a really good, good point saying the expectation part, right? Like, it's not like a transaction. It's just, you know, really, you know, asking yourself, like, how do you show up? in a room, you know, how are you going to connect intentionally? You know, how are you going to allow things to just manifest um, and not be so like, if I do that, if I reach out, I want this, like not to always Mm -hmm. want something out of those transactions you get. um, I think, I think is key to building long-term relationships that can help you down the road. Um, I would say in addition to the athletes that are listening that need more, um, that want to know like what they can start to do, a big, a big habit you want to get into is setting goals for yourself um, and for what you want. Because, you know, your goals lead to your vision, but without vision, you have no direction. Um, and goals have been a big part of how I've been able to um, make small increment successes and movements in what I'm doing. And I think sometimes we say, well, I want to go and I want to be a doctor when I'm done playing. Okay, well, how does that start now to get there? Um, and making those small goals and, and, and those small wins are actually what lead to that ultimate vision that you have. Um, so that's, that's a really big one. And, and then to Hannah's point of like, you know, just, just get used to failing. Like, because if you're not failing, you're really not trying. And that's something that I kind of had to learn. Like it took a 
ton of courage for me to create my first event that was just for girl athletes. That was personal development. We didn't even touch a basketball or anything. We didn't touch any ball. And I bring, I brought all these athletes from all different sports together. And I would get on the phone with these coaches and try to convince them to like bring their girls to this event. You would think like the speakers that I brought and just like me just reaching out to them, they'd be like, yeah, sure. Of course. Or just the simple fact that girls don't have enough resources nowadays. But a lot of them are like, well, I don't really see why my players need this. Like, I got it, I got it, I got it. And I was told no a lot. Um, but I kept pushing and I kept pushing. And I thought to myself, this is even more why, this is a more of a reason why it's needed. Because ironically, everyone that said no was a male coach. And I was like, mm, this is even feeding more into why these girls need it. Because their coaches really don't understand they need it. So overall, I could have quit. I could have said, this is not going to work. This is a concept that shouldn't exist and doesn't exist. And I did it. And now it's pushed me to negotiating with major sporting apparel brands. I've been featured in Essence um, and so on and so forth. So that's awesome. That, that actually brings up to one of the activities that I've done with high school athletes is, um, and college athletes when thinking about trying to think about their vision and create, creating their values and vision and goals, like kind of all that stuff kind of is together, you know? Um, yep. But one of the activities is what's your favorite failure? So, mm. you know, like, how do we take that? Like, because, you know, these, fa these failing moments, like you, you took the no, you both were, have just talked about taking no, no, no. And, you know, those no's, still led somewhere else that you wouldn't be without them right, right. so mm -hmm. right so getting people to really think about you know like what's your favorite failure i don't know does, does something pop in my, to mind with either of you for a for like a failure or something where like actually it ended up being better because you learned or you grew or you you pivoted and did something else yeah i mean in a different aspect like I remember when I was in the Swedish national camp it was a week um, everyone's revving up to the Olympics I'm the only person who doesn't speak Swedish I can understand a few words um, I only knew one girl and she wasn't on my team for the week and the coach wouldn't speak English to me on the ice um, made me go first in the line. <laughs> and I just, at first I was like, oh, this is so unfair. I don't know how I'm going to get through this week. This is the hardest week physically, but also mentally that I've ever done and showed up to. And in the end, I keep going back to that moment. And even though I got cut, that's, that was the best thing that I've ever done. I showed up for myself. I said, you know what? I have to do it at this point because I've trained for it. I'm here physically. I don't know the language. I have no friends. And you just, you put yourself out there. You try your best. And actually, I was pretty shocked at how well I performed. And I wish that I had showed up for myself like that years ago. Mm -hmm. I wonder how I would have done in college if, if I had really, really, you know, focused and taken the negative comments um in a positive way and just put my head down and work for it so i mean it's hindsight like most even negative like some self-talk too right like yes of course self-talk and and you kind like, of made yeah is to shift it in that moment and you know yeah exactly like oh you're way too uh, weak upper body so i trained the hardest i've ever trained i could do more push-ups than i've ever done in my life at that moment um, to prove and, you know, be the fastest in the running races instead of the, the physical, you know, upper body tests. And it's just amazing what we're, we're capable of when we really got to do it. Oh, that's awesome. Um, what, Morgan, are some things, so we were going to, I was going to come uh, help Morgan with her event in New Orleans for... Uh. Final Four, and I was so excited. I was going to be doing some work on values um, and sort of helping people identify some core values. What are what's some other things that 
um, if you're if you're able to share it without giving away too much, um, some teasers, give us some teasers. Like what are some things that thinking of high school age, which I imagine are, is similar to, uh, to college as well. Like what are some things that we could start thinking about? You've mentioned about the importance, you've both mentioned the importance of thinking about yourself as more than an athlete now. Like let's not wait until you're done your sport. Like right now, you know, really kind of digging into identity a little bit. Um, so what are some things that you maybe would have, would have done um, that you like to do with, with girls to get them sort of thinking ahead a little bit about this stuff? Yeah, for me, it's, um, it's a lot about just having the conversation of like, who are you and what's your vision for your life and who are you beyond this game, um, the label athlete. That's, I just think that's more of the intentional conversation that we have to have. And a lot of the times it's perceived that this is like a sports teaches you so much, you know, it teaches you resilience and discipline and all this stuff that people say just naturally happens. I, however, feel like they have to be separate intentional conversations that, you know, girls are connecting not only to their sport, but to their life, how they deal with relationships with others, um, how they deal with their family and such. And so, um, that's what I just really like to do is create those intentional spaces. So vision boards is something that um, I really love doing and specifically not a vision board that has, you know, the car you want and the phone you want. And, you know, I've seen some, some pretty, um, <laughs> I'm not going to say shallow, but I am going to say some shallow material. things. Like, <laughs> right. Material things. Um, but really like, let's create a vision board on just like, who is, who do you want to be? Who do you want to become? Like, who is that highest version of yourself? And I did that with the high school team and multiple high school teams. And it's really interesting that you would think they don't have like uh, too much ideas like of, oh, wait, I'm in my mom's house. I do this, I do that. But I have just seen these girls flourish and say things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's inside of you. Like, let's <laughs> go, you know? So I just, that's what I love doing is just talking more about like who they are, where they're at and where they want to go. I love that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, the, the, maybe that's something too, that we can, we can help though. It's easier to do, I imagine in person, right. But maybe that's something that we could put together or try to help get people to think about. Um, Especially when you write it down, it's so different when yeah. you write it down. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I will have to say like, even for me, like, that's one thing I did. I don't really teach anything that I don't do or that I don't believe in. I just, I just don't. And when I went through my transition, and, and within sales and things like that, I was like, well, this isn't really what I want. Like, this is not the life I want. I can keep going down this road, but I know this isn't what I want. And I, I had to slow down and just like define the life that I wanted. And it took me days to do my vision board. And it really took me um, diving into multiple magazines and even creating my own of like, what it is that I want to see myself doing down the road and, um, or who I want to be. And um, almost 60% of my vision board has manifested. That's awesome. And do you go through um, like magazines, books, website, do you print things off? Like do you write words? Do you do a little bit of everything? So I, um, I really just did magazines first and I just cut out images that I like because it touched me in some way. And then I put it on the board. Um, now when I work with athletes, I create these for them. I create different quotes and things like that. And I give them like a whole basket of stuff that they can kind of move through and choose as along with a magazine. Um, so they're able to create that way. But I did mine with just magazines. That's mm -hmm. very cool. Mm -hmm. I also love what you said too about, I think we probably, when we were talking on the phone before your event mentioned this, um, the the whole sport builds character, sport builds resilience, you know, um, and we talked about, you know, yeah, it has to be intentional, you know, it could be opposite. It's also up to coaches, you know, like coaches have to connect those dots for kids. So that's part of what our youngest programs are, you know, trying to do is make that like, it's a, actually a, of an hour program, you know, maybe 60% of the class is about sport and fitness and making it fun, non-competitive sport too, just like learning about it. And then the other 40% is, you know, having conversations like, you know, we do a, and life is good game. So talking about, um, it's one of our mindfulness games. So you say something that's not like my, my sister's annoying me and life is good. You know, like I didn't do well on this test and life <laughs> is good, you know, getting them to like, just really 
start learning how to tune into their body and mind. There's a there's another little uh, mindfulness activity that we do where it's like my mind feels blank and my body feels blank, you know. And it's like just trying to get them. That's like the younger kid version. I feel like of what you're describing, you know, of like just how do we at a young age and then straight through continue to help reinforce that you don't it's not just like this magic thing that happens mm -hmm. right like we can be intentional we can really practice this stuff every day um and parents coaches whoever's working with these athletes it's not just like here's the practice plan do it it's like here's the practice plan and it didn't go well have a conversation with them about why it didn't go well like get them to really start to understand and dig in a little bit did yeah. you did any of you have coaches that you felt really so i we also work a lot with the mental side of of the game mm -hmm. and, and me personally outside of the nonprofit as well do, do either of you have any go-to sort of mental skills that you either practice yourself and or coaches that you were lucky enough to, to i feel like this is a much newer thing where it's more popular and accepted to like have a mental skills coach it wasn't something that i had throughout my career um did either of you have that or was it really kind of on your were you on your own a little bit um you can go first morgan okay um in terms of a mental coach no i've never had a mental coach um how have i had coaches that have you know really spoken into me and planted seeds that I wouldn't have been planted otherwise? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, the how I prepare now mentally versus, you know, how I prepared back when I was playing are, are a little bit different. Um, I'm just big on prayer and talking to God. I think he is the, <laughs> he's the ultimate mental strength coach you can have um, when dealing with anxiety and fear like that. And that's just where, that's where I go for it. Um, but in terms of coaches that when I didn't have the faith that I have now, um, I had one coach in particular at Florida State. He was one of the assistants. And um, our coaches had get, given us a task and said, um, come up with a word that you can refer back to when you start to, you know, things start to get monotonous or you're just not that interested or you're getting tired. What's that one word you can go back to to understand why you're doing what you're doing? And I used to, I, you know, and I thought it was a joke. I like pick some really silly word. And he looked at me and he said, no, Jones, your word is purpose. And I'm like, man, coach, whatever, like, whatever. He's like, no, your word is purpose because this game is really easy to you. But this, this is serving something way bigger than you can see right now. And there's a purpose for you playing basketball, being where you're being right now, long term. And I was like, okay, okay. And um, I mean, obviously now it makes so much sense, right? And it was like that seed that was planted um, you know, when I was in college of just like, this is bigger, you know, I need you to stick to this process now because down the road, like it, it's bigger than that. And so I think any coaches that are listening, like the value of speaking into your athlete's potential is astronomical. Mm -hmm. That's so mm -hmm. awesome. And it's, and it so also speaks to like a, the, the phrase, like the seed that you mentioned, you know, like it's, it speaks to how important our work is right with, um, either coaches, parents, young people, um, and that you might not necessarily see it right away. And I feel that way as a teacher, you know, I also teach as well. And it's sometimes, you know, four years down the road, five years, six years, you end up hearing from someone that's like, hey, that class, that one thing you said, like, I carry that with me, you know? And so uh, it, it is important to know, um, you know, how, how, the, how, I mean, that's one word. I love that. Like, it's one word that has been, it can be life changing, right? And so, mm -hmm um that's that's really awesome that that you mm -hmm. had that um experience and that you remember it too right that it's really become it's clearly become become part of you what do you yeah. know well i think uh we're kind of in an amazing time where now it's recognized how important the mental side of the game is i don't know if like i just missed it i mean things started to move that direction um but i think spending just as much time in a week at workout than uh, doing mental activities and assessing your emotions and why you're feeling that way and kind of breaking it down because I had a coach actually um, in grade 11. Her name was Brady and she was my first female coach and she really made an impact on me and all my friends that were on the team because we had a retreat um, and 
there was no ice. It was a couple workouts, but a lot of, you know, team building, the usual stuff, but also writing down your goals and also enforcing those habits that you need to know when you go into college and show up. It's not just like you show up and play. You need to have, you know, be five minutes early, even though it says two o'clock, you got to be there at one thirty, or, you know, um, and also just more activities on like how you're going to reach your goal and not just writing a goal and, you know, like, Oh, I want to go to the Olympics. Okay. Yeah. Like, we took a step back, we worked backwards. What does that look like every day um, for the next year? What does that look like every day for the next two years? What are your small goals in between? But um, I think that the mental side of the game was a little bit missed. When I was in college, I had amazing coaches, but I think we just, we focused on the school. We had study hall. We focused on video. We focused on, you know, um, like the other team's videos. We focused on practice, but how people are feeling, why they're feeling this way, uh, how can it affect your game is so important. I mean, we have all seen those teammates who have, you know, they have a bad day. It's, it could be a breakup. It could be a bad mark in school, but nobody talked to them about it and they're just having a bad game. But mm -hmm. what if there was a process in place where they knew how to assess and put, a, put aside that emotion and really focus on the game? Um, yeah, I think that's where it's headed to, which is amazing to see. Yeah, and, add, and to add to your point, Hannah, I think, you know, when we were athletes coming up, there was really no social media. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's a huge part in the growth of this mental health is the, the constant scrolling and processing information at a really fast and a high pace. Um, and, and back to what you were asking about, like, strategies that, that you can use. Um, I, I'm big, like, on social media of – not only like what you're posting and how you're, you know, you're showing up, but also like who you're following because that was a huge shift for me of following accounts that didn't really serve, serve you, yeah. me or purpose That's and crazy. shifting them to inspirational people that I wanted to be like, people that I wanted to emulate or follow what they're doing, how they're speaking, whatever that may be. That's a huge shift um, in growth for, for athletes. Yeah. Oh my so gosh. I, I noticed that as well. Um, when I created this post game professions account, obviously, like I've had my personal Instagram for so long, there's, you know, right. everything on there. But this post game, I'm following athletes, I'm following, you know, motivational accounts. I don't know how many times I say this, I'm like, this is so inspiring every time I go on this feed. And it's mm -hmm. just amazing how you can create that for yourself. Mm -hmm. Social media doesn't have to be a bad thing. Yeah. Right, right such a great ta very tangible idea i love that um all right i know that you both probably have to go so let's just do one last thing i'm thinking about our senior spring athletes um collegiate athletes or um those who uh, have uh you know season ab ended abruptly this can happen i was saying you know earlier to you both you know this this can happen for athletes that get injured right and there's right. this like they have this injury it's a season ending injury and maybe this is gonna also you know we're able to to they can they can certainly empathize or maybe people can now empathize with them more as well um but w do you have any bits of advice so one of the things i've been thinking about um obviously and when we talk with kids about emotion too, it's like, it's okay to feel anything, right? Like we would say, it's okay to feel however you're feeling. It's okay. What That's okay. And then it's like, how do we build some space so that you can then choose to put your attention on something helpful? So I think about, um, you know, things as being sort of, is this unhelpful for me to be constantly thinking this way or helpful for me to, you know, be thinking this way? So, you know, trying to recognize the, that it's, you know, can be really, really devastating for some of these athletes. Um, and also how do we, how do we help them in this moment 
um, find that space that they can then turn it into. This is a goal setting session. Like you are home with your piece of paper. Let's build that pyramid. Where do you want to go? What are your values? You know, um, how do we how do we help them? Do you guys have any tips for for that particular population that's really struggling with the end of their end of their potential athletic career when they, when they weren't expecting it? Go ahead, Morgan. <laughs> um, Good question, I know. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a lot of different um, avenues that that you can go there. I think, you know, to keep it kind of simple is um, you'll never go wrong with investing in yourself. Um, and whatever that looks like, that looks like that looks different for every single one of us. Um, we, we know where our shortcomings are. We know what our heart desires. And there's so many resources out here now um, uh, to learn new things or, um, you know, be a part of different programs or whatever that may be, obviously, you know, strong girls United. Um, but invest in yourself and, and whatever that looks like for you, that would be my, my, uh, my advice for an athlete that is coming up to that transition, whether it's an injury or due to the virus, um, is really start to invest in, invest in yourself. I love that. Yeah. And to add to that, just in general, it's kind of a daunting time. We all know it, it happens. Um, but just, especially now we're all at home, sit with it. Think about and appreciate your time with your sport and, you know, the friends you've made and, and just your college experience in general, and then get excited. I mean, gosh, we have been told what to do up until graduation. And I know we're used to being told and it's like a robotic thing, but now you can work out when you want. You don't have to work out. You can <laughs> have free time. You can learn how to play guitar. You never had time to do that. You can take an online course um, to learn a new skill that maybe you didn't take a course in before and now you're suddenly interested and get excited. And also it's daunting you know, the goal setting thing, it's like, ooh, where do I start? What, what goal's too big? What goal's too small? Oh, I don't think I can do this. Just start. I mean, write something down. That's how the idea of, you know, Morgan and I's dreams started coming true is writing something down initially, and it's completely different than where you end up. And even right now, it's going to be completely different in five years. And your first career might not be something you love, but how will you know until you, you try and you take those skills and you get the next thing. And it's really exciting. Honestly, it's scary to end your career, um, especially when you're not ready and you don't have that time to grieve. Mm -hmm. But once you reflect and you get excited about the possibilities, you can live anywhere, you can make new friends who aren't athletes. It's just, it's a really exciting time. So that's what I got. <laughs> Super positive end, note to end on. I love it. Okay. Um, where can people find you, Morgan? Um, you can find me on my website, morganmjones.com. Um, Instagram, it's morganjones underscore MJ. Um, on there, you will find um, Athletes Divisionaries page as well. The link is in my bio. <laughs> the link's in my bio. It's link so in the bio. <laughs> <laughs> But seriously, it is. It's in but, but actually, it is there. Um, it's the same across all the platforms. So, I mean, yeah, that's where I'm at. Awesome. How about you, Hannah? Um, okay, so we've got Post Game Professions uh, on on Instagram. The link's in the bio for the website. Or you can go to postgameprofessions.com. If you want to follow me personally, it's Hannah Moore, H-A-N-N-A-M-O-H-E-R, or I have a travel account <laughs> where I post my travel photos, the passport professional. <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty much it. But Wani, thank you so much for this. This has been amazing. Yeah, yeah. you know, one of the, I mean, I would say it started this way and I guess we'll end this way. We started talking about connection and how important connection is and just conversations with people and my absolute favorite thing about sport and why I want every like little girl to get into it and find a path somehow is the team that it builds both like 
while you're in it but I also feel like such a part of a team you know like we especially women like I feel like we are we are ready to lift each other up in, we in are. any way possible um and with each other's work and content and um I just it just like connect I mean it was through social media probably that we ended up even finding each other um but just all the connections that are made through sport. And I am a firm believer in what you both said about, you know, every person you meet, it is like you meet them with a smile. And if you can help someone, you know, put away a grocery cart or you can help someone do that, it doesn't matter the, how little or big it is, but those, those connections and people that we meet um, and just being, you know, kind to each other on social media and sharing each other's work. Like you never know where, where stuff will go. So I, I'm so excited that we, we have all connected and thank you for helping us. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Chat. And I will work on uh, putting together a little document um, with our collective stuff that people can, can download to get some ideas on paper as well. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you, Lonnie. Awesome. Yes. And thanks for what you're doing with, with the young. I mean, that's where it starts. So Right, right. It really does. So important. Appreciate it. Really